Here's a video from PragerU that tells a bunch of lies about what evolutionary biologists disagree about. Evolution. You learned about it in high school. It goes like this. Life started out with very simple forms, and then gradually, over hundreds of millions of years, morphed into all the forms we see today. Bacteria to Beethoven. Not a straight line, of course, but that's roughly how it went. This was the theory proposed by Charles Darwin in 1859, and with some modification, it's been embraced as unassailable by the scientific community over the last century. As evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins says, if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is either ignorant, stupid, or insane. But is that right? Are there no scientific reasons to doubt the evolutionary account of life's origins? Are there reasons to doubt the whole account in its entirety? No. Are there reasons to believe that an intelligent designer is a more effective explanation? Also no. In November 2016, I attended a conference in London convened by some of the world's leading evolutionary biologists. The purpose? To address growing doubts about the modern version of Darwin's theory. None of those doubts, by the way, were about whether creationism or intelligent design were false. That was not what the biologists debated. This was a meeting of the Royal Society called New Trends in Evolutionary Biology. And the main point of controversy was about to what degree more nuanced ideas about how selection works, how epigenetics works, etc. ought to be incorporated into the overall evolutionary model. Some of these new ideas are sometimes referred to as extended evolutionary synthesis. EES is not creationism, and a debate about the extent to which EES ought to be used to overhaul the current paradigm is not a debate about whether creationism or intelligent design are true. Let's look at just two scientific reasons to doubt this theory. First, the Cambrian explosion. A weird and wonderful thing happened 530 million years ago. I'll put a link in the description to the Royal Society meeting Meyer is talking about. On their website, you can see the abstracts of the talks that were given. The cause of the Cambrian explosion is not listed as a topic of discussion. A whole bunch of major groups of animals, what scientists call the phyla, appeared abruptly within a geologically short window of time, about 10 million years. These novel animal forms, exhibiting prototypes of most animal body designs we see today, emerged in the fossil record without evidence of earlier ancestors. Did you catch that? A huge number of diverse animals appeared with no discernible antecedents. So where did they come from? This question really bothered Darwin, and he acknowledged that he could give it no satisfactory answer. Nor can scientists today. The word satisfactory is doing a lot of heavy lifting here. Any answer that isn't God done it is not going to be satisfactory to any creationist. There are a few proposed explanations for the Cambrian explosion, all of which are more plausible and satisfactory than intelligent design. One is that the Cambrian is when organisms were unusually likely to fossilize. Far fewer animals had bones or shells back then, so it was extra rare for their body parts to fossilize. More organisms started to develop shell-like structures, and geological conditions at the time were such that there were more sediments capable of preserving even soft bodied fossils. The explosion may not have been an explosion of the number or diversity of organisms on the planet, but merely an explosion of fossils. Also, it's not as though there are no fossils at all which predate the Cambrian. The renowned biologist Eugene Koonin of the National Center for Biotechnology Information describes the abrupt appearance of the Cambrian animals and other organisms such as dinosaurs, birds, flowering plants, and mammals as a pattern of biological big bangs. So what caused all these new forms of life to arise? Probably the evolution of harder body parts. We don't know for sure that this is the case, but it's a far more plausible explanation than woo. That question leads to a second big doubt, the DNA enigma. In the 1950s, James Watson and Francis Crick made a startling discovery. The DNA molecule stores information as a four-character digital code. Strings of precisely sequenced chemicals inside the DNA helix store the instructions, the information, for building the crucial proteins that cells need to survive. Unless the chemical letters in the DNA text are sequenced properly, a protein molecule will not form. No proteins, no cells. No cells, no living organisms. No living organisms if you define life as essentially cellular. However, evolution begins at a level simpler than the cell. Chains of nucleic molecules can form, reproduce, and mutate, and thus evolve, without the need of a cell. Evolution can work its way up to the complexity of a cell. Bill Gates has said DNA is like a software program. Let's think about that for a second. For computers to run faster and perform more functions, 
they require new code. Well, the same is true for life. To build new forms of life, the evolutionary process would need to produce new genetic information, new code. But this raises questions about the creative power of natural selection and mutation. Natural selection is a simple sorting process. Species keep favorable mutations that allow them to survive, but eliminate bad mutations that cause their members to die out. No one doubts that natural selection is a real process and that it produces minor variations. But many biologists now doubt that it produces major innovations in biological form. Where exactly do you draw the line between minor variations and major innovations? This sounds like a new way of distinguishing between microevolution and macroevolution. The idea that one is possible but not the other is essentially the idea that small changes, for some arbitrary reason, can't add up to big changes. And there are debates among biologists about how natural selection works, but the idea that intelligent design is a plausible alternative to natural selection is not taken seriously. Creationists also like to point out whenever anyone uses software or code as an analogy for DNA. They they want you to think, well, software and code are made by smart people, and if DNA is a code, it must have been made by a smart person too. They talk about information as if it's woo, as if it's something that can't be material. To see why, think again about software. What happens if you introduce a few random changes into computer code? You'll likely mess it up, right? Though it might still work if you don't make too many changes. But if you make enough random changes, your program will stop functioning altogether. You certainly can't keep doing this and expect some cool new program to pop out. You can if you have a selection mechanism which filters out changes in the code which hamper functionality and preserves changes that increase it. There's a mathematical reason for this. In all codes and languages, there are vastly more ways of arranging characters that will generate gibberish than there are arrangements that will generate meaningful sequences. And this applies to DNA. Remember, natural selection only selects sequences that random mutations generate. Yet experiments have established that DNA sequences capable of making stable proteins are extremely rare, and thus really hard to stumble on randomly. How rare? While working at Cambridge University, molecular biologist Douglas Ack showed that for every DNA sequence that generates a relatively short functional protein, there are 10 to the 77th power non-functional sequences. Now consider that there are only 10 to the 65th power atoms in our galaxy. So finding a new DNA sequence capable of building a functional protein is like searching blindfolded for a single marked atom among a trillion Milky Way galaxies. Talk about a needle in a haystack. This figure is based on Axe's experiment in which he used a particularly mutation-sensitive variant of an enzyme. University of Kentucky biologist Arthur Hunt did a great debunking of Axe's figures in an article in the evolution blog Panda's Thumb. I'll put a link to that in the description. He says, Axe deliberately identified and chose for study a temperature-sensitive variant. In altering the enzyme in this way, he modeled a variant that would be exquisitely sensitive to mutation. And on this basis alone, we may conclude that the claims of ID proponents vis-a-vis -vis Axe 2004 are exaggerated and wrong. Axe responded that using the variant of the enzyme that's actually found in an organism would produce even lower probabilities. But he merely surmises this rather than running an experiment that actually produces any such data. As I show in my book Darwin's Doubt, even four billion years of life's history is not enough time to overcome a search problem this big. So two serious doubts about modern Darwinian theory. The Cambrian explosion, the sudden appearance of new animals, which evolutionary theory has failed to explain, and the DNA enigma, the implausibility of random mutations producing the information needed to build new forms of animal life. Scientists who know about these problems are not ignorant, stupid, or insane. They are just appropriately skeptical. I'm Stephen Meyer, Senior Fellow at the Discovery Institute for Prager University. Meyer brings up that meeting of the Royal Society as though these issues were what was discussed among the members in attendance, or as though there are reputable biologists who think that naturalistic accounts of evolution are seriously doubted. This isn't the case. Now, if you were to point this out to Meyer, I would expect him to say, well, I never said that they were what was discussed. And he doesn't say that explicitly. He just happens to mention a conference of prestigious scientists that has nothing to do with these issues for no reason, I guess.
everyone who helps me out on Patreon. You're a big help. Thanks so much.